what a wonderful observance so far. And we thank God that we're in this place on this day. Truly, this is the day the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. A well-established protocol has gone forth, but I want to be sure we include our veterans on all levels, our active duty force, and our future uh, members of the armed forces. And I also want to be sure we include our minister of music and his new bride, Sister Michelle. Yes, we thank the Lord for them. Uh, we also want to take a moment to acknowledge the presence of the First Lady of this church. Can't go anywhere without her, who is an incredible person that God has put in my life. For all the others that were included in the protocol, we say God bless you one and all. Today I'll be reading from Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. I'll read this from uh, two different translations. <laughs> Ephesians 4, 6 and 7, King James. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now from the message. Don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worrying into prayers. Letting God know your concerns. Before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything concerning, everything coming together for good, will come and settle on you. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. Let us pray. Father, we ask that first you empower us to recognize the great contributions these veterans have made. Some are with us standing today. Some did not return from the battlefield. But we do thank you for each and every contribution. And keep us always grateful for these great sacrifices. Now, the Lord, we ask your blessing upon this time that we're calling sermon time. Visit, visit us through your word. Empower us and equip us that we may serve both God and country too. In your name we pray. Amen. The sermon title... The Jihad of the Soul. Don't run off yet. The Jihad of the Soul. On September 11, 2001, we, the people of the United States, woke up and discovered that we were in the middle of a holy war. A Jihad. Up until that point, we didn't know that there was such a possibility. Yes, there were a few Muslim sects that had caused us problems, had attacked us. Uh, we remember the detonation of the bomb in the parking lot of the World Trade Center in February of 1993. And that was on June 21st, 1998, a rocket propelled grenade into the embassy, uh, U.S. Embassy in Beirut. My brother-in-law was there and survived, thank God. And we remember several other little skirmishes. But we didn't realize until that point that we were in the middle of a holy war. There were people in this world who did not like us, did not love us, did not care for us. And we didn't know it until that day. We didn't realize that they had not only a little skirmish with us, but had declared war, a, a jihad. Now, while we're saying this, I want us to understand that all Muslims, all Muslims are not jihadists in the way that term has come to be and come to be used. That, that, that's not the case for all Muslims. Muslims fall into different categories, and we have to understand that. Let me just say a few things about Islam, and we'll move on. First, 
we need to realize that Islam is one of the three Abrahamic religions. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam make up the Abrahamic religions. And as such, that means that they're part of the company that came out of Abraham, and they all call Abraham their father. Second, the primary goal of Islam is to teach men and women to submit completely to God. Now they may call God by a different name and they mean something quite different than we do, but they got from Father Abraham that notion that all of us should be submitted to God. Third, the Quran tells us that we are respected by true Muslims. I'm reading from the Quran. It says, surely those who believe, those who are Jews and the Christians and the converts, anyone who believes in God and believes in the last day of judgment and leads a righteous life will receive their recompense from the Lord. They have nothing to fear, nor will they grieve. That's taken right from the Quran. So uh, often if you read, read a true Muslim, they'll call us people of the book. And fourth, and finally, the primary teaching of Islam concerning the jihad is the holy war of the soul. Like Christians, Muslims believe that there's a war on the inside. So they can affirm what Paul told us. Paul said in Romans 7, For I delight in the law of, the God, of God from the outward man. But I see another member in my body warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this death? And again Paul wrote, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these two are contrary the one to the other so that we cannot do the things that we would. And again he wrote, well, we'll stop there. And, and right there he wrote those things. Telling us that there's a war on the inside of us. There's a war competing for our souls. We need to understand who we are before we get into this message today. We are spirit. We possess a soul and we live in a body. We are spirit. God made. God breathed. We are made in the image of God. But we possess a soul. And in that soul is our will, our emotions, and our intellect. And we are carried around in a body. The Bible teaches us that we have to win the war, the holy jihad within us, and subdue that, that uh, soul to the spirit. James wrote, Wherefore, laying aside all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul. He was writing this to the church. He was saying, yes, your spirit is born again, but you got to get your will, your intellect, and your emotions born again. And that's a battle. That's a battle. Now, our text. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 was written by the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul was a man who had won that battle. Paul was a man who had subdued his soul to his spirit. And uh, that wasn't an easy process. And it wasn't a lifelong process. It was a temporary process that had to be repeated over and over and over again. So Paul would write, I die daily. I fight that battle and win daily. We need to kind of look at this a little closer. We have to understand this, Paul. And he's writing to this church in Philippi, a church he loves. And he tells them about his battle. He says, I've won the battle over anxiety. I've won the battle over fear. I won the battle over all that stressing in my life. And I want you to know, you don't have to be stressed over anything. But in everything, just pray and let God know what you want. And the peace of God will come over you. And you will have the victory in that arena. Now why is that so important? Let's go back. 
back and look at Paul's life in Philippi. Paul was minding his own business in Asia Minor, enjoying his ministry, and God gave him a vision. And in that vision, God said, there's a man in Macedonia standing in front of you, and he wants you to come over to Macedonia. So Paul leaves Asia Minor. No other Christian worker had ever left Asia Minor, and he marches up to Philippi. When he gets to Philippi, he encounters a young lady who has a, an evil spirit, a root worker, if you would. And this root worker is making money by casting spells and telling fortunes and doing whatever root workers do. And Paul casts that spirit out of the woman, and when he casts the spirit out, her master gets mad and puts Paul in prison. Now Paul is sitting in prison. Paul and Silas, and, and they're in prison, and it's one of those ancient prisons. There are no resources. There are not even lights. So at midnight, Paul and Silas, y'all know the story, they have a prayer meeting. And they start to pray and praise God, and the, and the earthquake comes, and the, the chains are broken, and they're set free, but they don't leave. And the prison and the uh, prison guard comes and he says, I'm gonna kill myself because the prisoners have all been set free. And Paul said, Don't do that. We didn't leave. We didn't leave. We're still here. And when the prison guard saw that, he said, What must I do to be saved? And that's how the church in Philippi got started. Now let me just back up a minute. If that had been you and uh, not you and me. Some other church down the street. And I said, let's go to Macedonia. And you were with me and we went to Macedonia and they threw us in jail. Can you imagine the conversation we would have had? I said, Reverend Black, you missed the Lord this time. I'm sorry, fella. That, that was no vision. That was some peace that you had last night. You missed the Lord. You missed the Lord. But Paul, is he so calm and peaceful? Serene? Sitting in prison? In a foreign jail. Y'all seen those TV shows locked up in a foreign jail? This man has total peace. So when he writes this to the church in, in um, Philippi, they know. He knows what he's talking about. So I want to deal today with uh, three battlefields for our soul. Three places that we need to get the victory. Three wars we got to fight at the same time. The first battlefield is the battlefield of trust. The battlefield of trust. In this text we see Paul won the battle of trust. And how do we know if we've won the battle of trust? We have a peace that passeth all understanding. If we're stressed, if, if we are, have tension on the line, we have not won the battle. If we're worried, if we're having panic attacks, we have not won the battle. When we go to there's a knot in our stomachs when we pull in the parking lot. We have not won the battle. When we go and encounter that rough person in our lives, if there's all kind of anxiety coming on the inside, we have not won the battle. But we can win the battle. Jesus was constantly disappointed with his disciples because they never fought that battle. In Matthew 6, and I heard Ms. Jefferson refer to this in Sunday school. In Matthew 6, he said, which of you by taking thought can add one cubic unto your statue? And why taking thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe 